Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm pleased to welcome Jefferson Pinder tonight to talk with you all. Jefferson Pinder was born and grew up in Washington, DC. He got his BA Bachelor of Arts in Theater and MFA in Mixed Media from University of Maryland. And he also studied at the Oslo Theater Conservatory in Florida. Jefferson is currently on faculty at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Jefferson has shown his work all over, um, a few notable museums, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the High Museum in Atlanta, the National Gallery of Art in DC, and the Tate Modern in London. Jefferson and I met when he, I took his, um, his advanced drawing class in 2004 at the University of Maryland. And I'm grateful to have followed his practice all these years and that we've kept in touch and to welcome him here tonight. So I'll throw it over to you, Jefferson. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Leah. Um, boy, you know, I quick story. You know, when I met Leah, I had no idea um, how art and, and math could make such incredible installation work. And I, I just marveled at how Leah like went from um, one discipline to another, but like didn't forget where she came from. So I, it's a pleasure and an honor um, to have Leah Franco as one of my colleagues and um, an honor to say that she used to be a student, but um, really um, it's a privilege to be here today. Um, okay, so how about this? We're gonna start not with those two handsome guys, but we're gonna start with this, which is um, a piece that was written about me in, in 2015. Um, I, I titled this lecture, uh, Don't Call Me an Activist, because this is a, something that I guess a lot of um, African-American artists have to deal with is, is this weight of representation. Um, and in some regards, trying to negotiate what it means to be an artist versus uh, what it means to be an, an activist. Personally, I'm, I'm, I prefer not to be called an activist, but I can understand how the work teeters and, and uh, teeters that edge between um, what you might understand as, as an activist practice or a social practice. But I think all of the power, and I say this with a smile on my face, all the power is when people um, understand you as an artist and they have to negotiate what activism is or what, what that means to be an activist. Um, or a, you know, if you're an artist and people have a hard time figuring out where those boundaries lie, that, that there's a lot of power in that slippage. Um, so I always shake off um, the term activism because um, in, in some respects, I think it's more empowering to be an artist. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, this was a piece uh, that was written in Chicago Tribune and, and boy, it, it really set me off and, and got me upset. Not because it, it's not uh, as if Jefferson Pinder doesn't want to be the artist um, that has an exhibition for the Black Lives Matter movement, but I just prefer to be more subtle, you know, really. I mean, if, if you, you think about it, it's, it's like that um, titles of any kind can be restricting. And I think for African-American artists or artists of colors, um, artists of color rather, titles are part of the, the terrain of being a contemporary artist. And, and, and this is nothing new. So I'm gonna quickly go through a lineage of artists um, and try to do it effectively. I'm gonna put my timer on so I, I make sure we have time for questions. But who you're looking at right now is, is W.B.E.B. Du Bois and Alain Locke. And they kind of rivaled each other in uh, the early 20th century. Uh, because they were highly educated African-American men who um, understood the power of the arts in contemporary society. And when I say contemporary, I'm talking about the 1920s, 30s. Um, they were the pioneers of what could be called the Harlem Renaissance movement. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois believed that um, there is no way for an artist to create, a black artist to create and not make propaganda or not make work that is about the race. And that if they did make work that um, didn't fall under that umbrella, it, 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 it didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was um, the social justice. And if the work um, pushed 
those uh, that agenda forward, it's good artwork. On the right, you have Alain Locke, who really um, who believed in the power of art to create propaganda, but also understood that artists should have um, freedom and liberties to make whatever they want. Um, so in the 1930s, people were writing about it. it. It's no different today. Why? Because our society is completely screwed up. Um, I think it, until there's a point where a police officer can pull over, you know, um, a person like myself and identify me ways in ways other than my race, how would you expect um, a contemporary art gallery to be any different? I mean, really, and to be honest, uh, an art space, an art museum is a reflection of that society. So until our society can't recognize um, us as being uh, people of color, black, um, what have you, uh, I, I don't think that these conversations are, are gonna go away. Um, but when I think about you know art and activism, this is Edmonia Lewis and she graduated um, from Oberlin College and, and one of the first African-American people to graduate from that college. And she made um, incredible neoclassic work. And, you know, I, I think in, in many respects, do you call Edmonia Lewis an activist? I mean, it, her work is, is in a neoclassic tradition, but what she pulls into this neoclassic tradition are um, things that relate and connect to Africa, to Egypt. This is Cleopatra. Um, this was exhibited in the 1876 uh, Philadelphia Exposition. And then um, shortly after got lost and ended up at a, um, a horse cemetery, was found by a, a troop of Boy Scouts who then went and painted it white because they said, oh, this is old. So we're, we're gonna paint this sculpture white and make it right. Um, and then the Smithsonian found out about this and, and then it goes back into the museum and it becomes sacred. But um, Edmonia Lewis being a five foot um, African American woman who created, you know, monumental size sculpture. It, it, was she an activist in 1876? And that's the question. What about Palmer Hayden? Palmer Hayden is is what we consider the, the janitor who painted, um, who 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 emerged out of, um, I guess, a sanitation, a career in sanitation, to make incredible paintings like this. That, um, and you know, and 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 the the question is 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 Palmer Hayden an activist? Um, or was he just portraying what he saw around him and, and by its nature, or by his nature of who he is in society, everything that he makes is, is, is at work of an activist because God knows this is a representation of black culture, which, which hadn't been seen a lot prior to this time, which is like the dignified, you know, young artist who comes home after a day of, 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 of labor and, and finds the time to paint. Um, Elizabeth Catlett, um, from the, from the 1920s and 1930s, she died maybe like 10, 11 years ago. But uh, a lot of people wonder like, well, where did the Harlem Renaissance come from? And here she is. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the Harlem Renaissance, uh, this is Charles White, um, has its roots, not necessarily anywhere in, in Europe, but in, in um, Mexico City. And, and it, it, to, to think about like, well, the most um, powerful black arts movement that, that our country has seen emerged um, from training that many young African-American artists had from this gentleman, Diego Rivera. Um, so when you think about it and you think about like, well, what's more pure, uh, what is more American, the American art tradition um, that extends well beyond any European tradition in the United States or the African-American Renaissance movement that was inspired by the Mexican uh, muralist, uh, Diego Rivera, is, who truly connects to, to Amer a Northern American tradition that goes back hundreds of years. So you could argue that African-American artists during this time were more American than any European trained American artist. Um, this is my mentor, um, David Driscoll. And uh, you know, when I think about it, he, he taught at the University of Maryland College Park and, and this is what um, Dr. Driscoll was known for doing is, is these, these pine trees from Maine. And to be an African-American who has the freedom and, and wherewithal to paint pine trees from Maine, is, is that activism? Um, because that's strength to me. I mean, I think Dr. Driscoll could do more by painting a, a pine tree than I, could, I can with any of my protest videos. Somehow his presence in Maine was, was enough, I mean, he was the first African-American to be allowed into Skowhegan. So we're, we're talking about 
pioneering people that all they have to do is paint. The activism is, is their presence in the space. So um, with that, I'm gonna, gonna move a little bit more into, into my work and, and what it is that, that I do. Um, I was trained at the University of Maryland. Uh, this is um, Veswold Meyerhold, and he was one of the, uh, the, the theater practitioners that I studied when I was in school. Uh, one of the cool things about Meyerhold is he really believed in the body and the power of the body. Um, he was a contemporary of Stanislavski, and Stanislavski believed that, you know, if you were trying to recall, um, um, like, or try to have a moment on, on stage that was sad, or that was really, uh, um, you were lamenting, let's say, a loss of, of, of a parent, you wouldn't necessarily um, pull it from your body. That would be um, the Meyerhold technique, but Stanislavski believed that you would go into a psychological place where you would recall something from the past, right? Meyer, Meyerhold, this gentleman believed the opposite. He believed um, that you, you, you can't fake it, and that this recall stuff could work to a certain degree, but if I made you go around uh, your building 30 times and then had to, you had to deliver a monologue, your body would be more honest than, than your head. So he devised a technique of um, what you call biomechanics, which is uh, using the body to cre create an emotional response. He also wanted to, to create um, a theater environment in which there was no lead character. There was no hierarchy of, okay, this is a one beautiful male lead. This is a beautiful female lead. He was like, to hell with that. Everybody wears the same uniform. Everybody works together. We are a machine on stage. We are to create a, a unified um, human machine in which everyone works together to create an emotional impact. So you're like, okay, well, what, what's... Uh, you know, is 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 Meyerhold an, an activist? You know, and that's the question because Meyerhold was was um, came home after the the revolution, after the counter revolution, and and found his wife stabbed, you know, and killed. He was then put to prison, and and he died in prison in 1940. So I don't know. I mean, I think it depends on society. I mean, who would think that, you know, creating a human machine, especially in early Soviet um, theater, would, would be considered a threat. But in the counter-revolution, it wasn't Soviet enough. His work wasn't Soviet enough. Um, and he found himself in a position where he was forced to do particular kind of work, and he refused to do that. And he was, his wife was killed, and he was put to jail, and he died there. So what does that have to do with me? What does it have to do with an African-American in, in Washington, DC? Well, I had a good teacher who, who opened me up to, to different things. Um, and then I began to understand that through the, through the guise of being a, a young African-American, somehow everything was, was different. You know, it's not like, um, and, and within that, there was a lot of um, room for conversation about um, identity. So I started to work with video work endurance work in which I'm creating Herculean uh, tasks. Uh, this is a street of Baltimore. This is a 300 pound log and I'm, I'm pulling it through the streets. I mean, really blunt performance work where there was like an emotional response from, to a physical action. Like if I made a task for myself and the task was so tough, people would see me execute that task and they would feel for me. I was choreographing empathy, getting people to understand possibly my condition, my state, um, and, and creating connections with that. So this is early work. Um, I usually I had the uniform of wearing a, a, a suit uh, and, and the suit and tie was was reminiscent of uh, social activism, but the work itself, uh, you know, I, I never really considered it as such. I wanted it to have play. I mean, I wanted somehow to have a broader and more open conversation about what it could be and the humanity of the work itself. And what I mean by that is like, as artists, we always have to try to think about how do we give ourselves as much space as possible? How do you write that grant proposal without saying everything you wanna do so that you can have a little room to, to play? You know, it's like, maybe you wanna create a, a proposal where there's a skeleton and then eventually get into the details and it could take, you know, you know, depending on how much time you have and what the deadline is, you can go into as much, many details as you, as you want, but you start off with that framework. Um, and that's what's happening with the work, uh, with the early work, it was all about like trying to, um, to have a task and the task would be um, Herculean and having 
the community pitch in to, to help execute that task and in some way creating community in the moment just as sometimes when you see a car st stuck in the snow and you see an, an improvisational community that emerges and when everybody tries to work to get that car out you know that's when i get the chills and and i, I try to understand that you know the power of a collective um that can emerge in, in a moment's notice but also the reality that um that's ephemeral that it's not a, a permanent um, kind of connection. And sometimes these, these ones that, that seem really important are, are, are fleeting. Um, thinking about restraints, restrictions, also about like history. Um, this is a, a courthouse in, in Maryland. And one of the, 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 the things um, that I do is as I research history and I, I learned that I guess the last person to be lynched in my home state uh, was lynched in a straitjacket and was lynched on, on a courthouse um, yard. And I began to think about the connections between um, what was going on in that time with uh, Harry Houdini, who was traveling throughout the United States and figuring out ways of, of breaking free from restraints and holds. And I think about this young black man who was lynched on a tree in a straitjacket who didn't have that, you know, that training. And what would happen if, if, if hordes and groups of people were trained how to break free from holds and how that could be empowering? So 80 years after the day that Matthew Williams was killed um, on that, that courtyard, um, you know, uh, I created a performance piece in which I tried to relook and revisit history, trying to see if I could break free from this hold. Um, spending time training how to... How to uh, to escape a straitjacket hold and while, while being suspended. I think the whole performance was, was about uh, the relooking at, at history and trying to see if we can, um, almost in an Afrofuturist style, refashion it so somehow we're, we're reclaiming it as, as not necessarily the victim, but perhaps um, creating a future in which um, we're empowered by, by the past. Okay. Um, Working on a variety of, of different pieces. This is Relay, um, a piece that I made where, where it's like one continuous runner after another creates a uh, almost like a relay over a six mile period where, um, again, we're kind of a, a right when you seems like one individual runner is running out of, of, of energy, he's renewed and there's another one and, and it goes on and on uh, for about 25, 25 minutes. Uh, another work, Ben Hur, is a similar idea is um, you know creating a performance piece in which you have all of this energy and where all these people are, are working together in unison uh, to to move forward and, and to create a human machine. But after time, and and through I guess the, the rigorous routine, it, the machine begins to break down, and each individual um, bows out of the performance one at a time. Um, the amazing thing about this performance is, is we have a group of people, some who are rowers and some who are not. And the, this gentleman right here at the front, his name is, is Daryl Atwell, and he is the only one, the only people who knew how to row going into this performance. But um, everybody watched him because he was the first rower. And because he had the best form, he gave out the quickest. And so then after Daryl gave out, it was almost, it was a performance of watching how um, the piece would collapse into itself. So let's let's take a look for a second. Let's see if I can play this. Yesterday, uh, it was uh, it was a day in which I did absolutely nothing. If anybody asked me what I was doing, I would have said creating.
So you get the idea. Um, in a Darwinian sense, everything begins to break down and, and it's like survival of the fittest. Um, so, and I mean, and that's the re recurring theme in a lot of the early work, which is, um, uh, which is uh, even though they were working together as a unit together, we kind of fall individually. Um, and so there's, there's a, a gradual um, inevitable breakdown. So th this gives you a little bit of a context of, of a lot of the earlier work that, um, that kind of led to, to more of the group dynamics um, eventually working with break dancers to, to choreograph the, the movement of a rev revolt and, and thinking about uh, what had happened in the streets of Ferguson in 2014 and, and trying to think about like, how would you describe that through movement and through artistry is, and, and what better uh, performer can you think of than a break dancer that's, that's used to the combat, it's used to, to a particular kind of um, restorative uh, immediation that, that, you know, if, if two people aren't getting, getting along, they, they battle on, on, the, on the floor. So the piece was really about like, you know, almost like creating a, a, uh, a morality play, if you will, in which uh, a group of break dancers are reenacting the physicality of, of, of revolution. Okay, so that leads to, um, that gives you a little bit of a, I guess, a context of where I'm coming from. And this is what I did um, in the summer of 2019. 2019, uh, I had resources from the Guggenheim um, Fellowship. Uh, I, I, I won an award in which I had some resources to create a performance piece. So I, I put in a proposal for creating a road trip. And I called it the Afrofuturist road trip that traveled all throughout the southern part of the United States, the red state territory, to have conversations about um, brutality and, and um, race. But uh, the more I researched, and, uh, and this was 2017 that I originally had the idea, I began to think about like, well, it'd be great to wait and try to do a, a road trip that coincided with the red summer, which I was familiar with, but I was trying to figure out, well, how, how do I align my practice with this historic event? Many of you may be familiar, some of you don't know, but 1919 was a really screwed up year for black people. Um, it, it, I mean, it, almost in every major city, there was, there was a lynching, there was a, uh, an uprising. And usually when there were uprisings, uh, it, you know, black population was rioted upon rather than being the rioters that, that I think the media would like to, to, to think of African-Americans as. Um, I, I really challenge that term of, of riot because I think that um, in many of these situations, the African American community was burned, was was looted, was was destroyed. So, how do you make work about this? That's the question. I mean, this is so damn dark. I mean, it's it's probably you know some of you are like, man, this is this is really intense. Well, you just start by looking at the history and and, and examining. Um, perhaps loopholes, things about um, the time and, and the period and which connect to us today and, and trying to find maybe poetry in, in, in the events. And, 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 and so for me, I, I was thinking a lot about um, the correlation between a lot of the, um, the uprisings that, were, or that was happening in 1919 and, and the fact that many uh, black soldiers were coming back from um, World War I and these black soldiers were taught how to kill white people. And that was a fact. It was just an inevitable fact is that our US government is really good at training people how to kill. And um, never before in US history did such a large group of African Americans learn how to kill, but in particular were taught how to kill white people. Um, and when they came back from World War I, from some of the most, you know, from the, the dirtiest um, kind of work, uh, they, they found themselves um, fighting the true enemy, which was back at home. In, in the Jim Crow South. So I began to think about this and start thinking about um, some of the other work that I'd done. I, I did some reading um, to try to understand the history of the, of the events and, and understanding what, what, what does the locations have to do with that history. Um, this is one of the biggest events that happened in Chicago in that summer, July 27th, um, Eugene Williams was, was floating in a flotational device 
in the south side of Chicago, and he drifted from what was considered to be a black beach to a white beach, and he was hit on the head with a brick. The cops came after this kid had drowned in the water, and the cops refused to make any arrest from these white um, Irish gang members that had been taking these rocks and throwing them at, at, at black kids that were floating in the water. Um, young African-American soldiers who had come back from World War One were like, okay, it's on, I'm going home, I'm getting my weapon. Um, and they came back and you had five days of civil unrest that ended when the National Guard was called in. This is just really a dynamic picture where you see like um, a soldier of rank, which is this uh, the African-American corporal on the left and, and a private on the right. But um, I, I, would, I would love to know what the conversation was, but you can tell that there's a dynamic of of rank and power, which has no significance to the person with the weapon. So how do you make work about this? That's, that's the, the real question is, is this is just such an intense history. So it's, again, it's, it's trying to find the poetry in the brutality, um, in the anguish and in, 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 in the pain, and, and also trying to understand that um, there, there are just really uh, wonderful moments of strength. Um, so I begin to think about training, like how are people trained and how are civil rights activists trained? How are people who have to endure um, brutality um, taught how, how to, to withstand, uh, I, I guess, um, a conflict? And so I started looking at civil rights photographs. Um, I began to look at uh, how people are trained and I was also thinking about military training and these are photos from SNCC, and SNCC is the um, it's a uh, it's the Southern National uh, Christian Coalition, and they were a group that that really um, did some really incredible um, passive uh, resistance training, in which they um, practice enduring blows from one another. They, I mean, their big mantra was, we don't want the first time for you to be hit, is to be hit by a white cop on the street. We, we want you to know what it feels like from somebody who cares. So, and, and that idea just, just kind of blew my mind away. And I began to think about like, and, and, and trying to do research on how are Black Panthers trained? I mean, we know that they're kind of a badass group, but we, we don't know exactly like why they got that title or we just know that they're slick and they look wonderful. And, you know, they, they carry around these weapons and, and they're, you know, they're menacing. But the more research I uncovered, the more I learned that really, I mean, it, that was the beauty of, of looking like a badass was much more powerful than actually training themselves how, how to shoot a weapon that even though they were carrying these weapons, a lot of times these weapons weren't loaded. And people like to think of the Black Panthers as a movement that is known for, um, uh, for really like being able to stand its ground, but, but a lot of that was the theatricality. It wasn't the reality that they were trained to kill, rather it's like they wanted, you, you didn't want to mess with them because they looked um, powerful. They drilled together. And the training was almost a theatrical training where, you know, a lot of people don't realize that Black Panthers had a breakfast program that was, you know, a lot more expensive and much more dominating in their time than learning how to shoot at a rifle range. But if you understand the Black Panthers, you, you, you think, well, okay, they're known for their power. But the power is something that, um, that, that was almost a theatricality to the reality of, of um, taking these resources and putting it in the community. That's what the Black Panthers did. And that's, that's the power of the movement. It wasn't shooting white people on the streets. The power of the movement was, was feeding kids who were hungry. Um, but this was um, part of the dynamic. So for this performance piece, all right, getting back to like, how do you make art from all of this? I wanted to create a performance piece that was all about the training and maybe the beauty of uh, looking like a powerful unit and acting together and actually finding um, individuals who would teach us how to defend ourselves, people who teach us how, how to kill in a, a militaristic style. Uh, we worked with Marine Corps vets that come back from Persian Gulf Wars and we, and we were um, kind of, uh, we quickly found out that, that, it, it, that this kind of training is, is, is dark um, and it leads you down a path that, that's, that's hard to come back from. I mean, the people who were training us were obviously damaged or obviously had, had, had a, um, an, an intense existence with their training at that at sometimes um, was not beneficial for them moving forward. So the idea was that um, 
we had to think about ways to not only going to that place where we were preparing ourselves for conflict, but how do we come back from that? How do we come back from that training? Um, yeah, these, these, are, these are images from um, This Is Not a Drill, which is a performance piece that we toured through the southern part of the United States through the Red Summer Road Trip that was associated to, to 1919. It's thinking about training and thinking about creating this, this feel of, of intimidation. And this is Sidra. Sidra was our kind of magical performer. Um, Sidra uh, came to our crew late uh, when we realized that we needed somebody to help us. Not only, you know, there were plenty of people to teach us how to kill, but there wasn't many people who could teach us how to balance. And Sidra um, is a yoga instructor and, and she became part of our crew. And her job was to bring us back from this intense training. And, and that was how we ended the performance each night was these yoga exercises that we tried um, to perform after um, going through intense, rigorous physical exercise um, and mental uh, kind of like, you know, demonizing and, and thinking about like how to prepare our, our, our bodies for, for violence. Um, I'm going to skip through this. This is another piece that happened in um, Houston. This is called Fire and Movement. Uh, in, in 1917, a, a unit of African-American soldiers um, were stationed outside of Houston and they were uh, continually attacked by the police and insulted by the police until one day uh, they just realized that they wanted to take things into their own hands and they attacked the police station and um, or they um, went on a route to attack the police station, but they never made it. So. This performance piece was about a fateful night in which uh, a highly trained uh, group of soldiers, black soldiers, um, attempted to kill police. And, and they killed two police officers um, and 15 civilians. And uh, then was the largest court martial in, in United States history. And it happened in, in Houston, Texas. So it's again, it's and and. And in Houston, Texas, there's an open carry law. So what we decided to do is um, with my group of, of well-trained people that we'd been working with in Chicago and a, tr a, a troop of people in, in Houston, we created a performance piece in which we reenacted that fateful route in which these um, soldiers um, killed 15 civilians um, on the way to the police station. Um, so this was a, a really famous bridge in, in that reenactment. And, and we were training with these two by fours and we were learning these maneuvers by, by US Marines. And, and they were teaching us how to hold the weapon, all of the safety um, precautions needed. And I think that there's just a, a really kind of a, a, an incredible dynamic is when you, even when, with a two by four, if you're trained how to hold that two by four by a weapon, uh, like a weapon rather, uh, you, you'll, you'll find yourself like, I, I, I think we, we had more people were, were threatened by us probably the day we were, we were holding these two by fours and we actually act, had the, the rifles for the performance. So I, I think there's something about the ambiguity and abstraction of, of, of holding this, this, this piece of wood. So I'm, I'm kind of going through this quickly. I'm going to try to um, wrap it up. But the, the last piece within this kind of 1919 Red Summer Road Trip uh, was float. And as I talked to you about what happened at the beach in Chicago, at Lake Michigan, I started thinking about, well, what, what could we do? What could be the poetic action that could happen that somehow could get us to think about um, the history of this event and also where we're at today? So the idea is like, if we, if we just occupied that space as a, a mixed race group of people, I think that would speak volumes to that moment. And then the idea was like, how can you get a hundred people on inner tubes in the middle of the lake with a current and, and keep them together um, and keep them unified? And so that was kind of like the mission of float. Um, it, it, it kind of turned into to much more, but it was like, you know, how 
do you get in the water and you know a hundred years of the day in which this this young man was killed that eugene williams was killed and not have a really impactful performance i, I don't think there was a way we could lose um i know that might sound odd but i think sometimes just having physical bodies present in space i mean it was a human monument i mean you get a hundred people out on the lake doing something like this and, and by the way it's um, you cannot use a flotational device in Lake Michigan anymore. We had to get permission from the city. So the idea that this is one opportunity for you to use a flotational device in this lake, the only requirement is that you think of um, Eugene Williams and that everybody think about this situation and this history. And, and that was it. You know, we don't need a script. We don't need anything fancy. We just have to be there. We have to have our bodies in, in physical presence, almost like in the crosshairs of, of, of this moment in history and just be present and be, be a witness that that's enough. There it is, drop the mic. And um, all of this work came together um, and, and additional pieces of, from, from the tour like this one, uh, which is Elaine, which has its own narrative as well. It all came together for an exhibition that happened at um, the San Francisco Art Institute. And that was the last exhibition before the school was closed. Um, so I feel really fortunate, but I think with, with this kind of work, I, I think there's, it's, there is a, a bit of a, um, a trap and the trap is, is making sure that you're, you're allowing for enough poetics to happen, enough of the beauty as, as we started this conversation with is, is like, it, you know, you have W.E.B. Du Bois who's like, you know, there's, there's propaganda and you have to make work that is propaganda for the race. It's your responsibility. And you have Alain Locke who on one hand is saying that, you know, try to find the beauty in that, try to find the beauty in the work. So I believe that, that the truth is somewhere in between is in the slippage, you know, Rosalie Goldberg said that that's the beauty of performance art is it's not theater, it's not dance, it, it, you can't describe it. There's a reason why everybody hates it is because, because they don't get it. So, but within that, there's, a, there's, there's play, because if you have intention, you know, if you are thinking about um, all of the context of, of the world in which we live in, uh, I, I think you're gonna find the, the poetry and the beauty and even the most hor horrific circumstances and situations. Um, I think there's, there's something really beautiful about drill and training. You know, it's, I mean, the idea of training is, is that you don't have to think in, in the moment of crisis because you've already, you prepared your body for that moment. So you don't have to think, you can just do. And I, I think that so much um, of the existence of, of Blacks in, in our country has to do a lot with, with training. We just don't spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, I think it sums things up a little bit. Um, I, I think my last piece, uh, the one that I did three weeks ago with my son. My son's probably the age of a lot of the students here. Um, he's 24 years old. He just graduated from Columbia College in, in Chicago and trying to figure out what his next move is. But while he's figuring it out, I was like, you're gonna shoot, <laughs> you're gonna shoot a piece for your old man. And uh, he, 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 he shot this video and the video is, is um, called Prowl. And it happened in the Mount Greenwood neighborhood in Chicago where all of the police and police families live. Um, I shouldn't say all, let me back that up. Um, it's say the traditional um, white um, police officer that has maybe the longstanding tradition in Chicago. These are, this is the community in which they live because our police force is pretty diverse, but this neighborhood is, in, is not. It's, it's, it's a stark um, and, and staunch uh, rather um, conservative uh, political enclave in one of the most liberal cities in the United States. Um, when you drive through it, it I mean, the, the, you would think that one person is, is, is taking care of all of the lawns. It, it's just really well kept, um, beautiful in, in some respects because I think everybody is on the same page, but what page they're on is, is, is scary as hell. When you start seeing like um, some of the political um, signs that are on, on their lawns. So what um, my son and I did is we created uh, this, this performance piece uh, in which we assembled 17 drivers um, and in the middle of the night, um, or in, I, I shouldn't say in the middle of the night, but early um, night, we drove through the neighborhood, all 17 of us quietly. Um, and 
uh, this movement was was just uh, um, we were just checking out the neighborhood. We were, when the police pulled us over, we were just taking a drive. Um, and that was true. We documented a drive through. We had no signs, no Antifa signs, no Black Lives Matter signs. I mean, and I think this is when you're like, well, don't call me an activist. I think part of the reason I don't want you to call me an activist because an activist couldn't have been in that space. An artist can. Um, there's uh, protest is not allowed in residential neighborhoods in Chicago, but art pieces are. So trying to think of what you're called and how you are identifying yourself and what is the artist persona, that's important. And I guess when I say don't call me an activist, that's given me um, room and space to do what I need to do. So I mean, thank you so much. I, I appreciate um, the time today. I think um, we're right at 45 minutes. And I want to give you a chance to ask questions. Thank you so much, Jefferson. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I forgot. To, I should have mentioned your, your Guggenheim recipient in 2017. Sorry. No, please. No, Don. <laughs> Big omission. Um, if anyone has questions, you can list them in the chat or you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and pop on and um, yeah, we'll take it from there. Hi, Jefferson. Um, I have a question. Uh, can you talk a little bit um, for our students? Um, my husband's not in the other room. Let me hang on. Let me close the door. <laughs> I've got an echo. Could you talk a little bit about how, you know, this work seems, as you're describing it, it seems so powerful through your eyes of sort of the, the creator, the choreographer, the, the mind behind it, and the experience you have in creating it. Could you talk a little bit about how then this work lives in documentation for the gallery later as an art piece and, and whether you see a difference between the two of those or are you considering the two just one product of the other? I think that there's this really powerful line between sort of the experience and the embodiment of, of the, the projects you shared with us and then perhaps how the majority of the world interacts with them. Right. That is the struggle. That's the the multi-million dollar, ten thousand dollar question. I don't know. It, it, how can you create a video piece that captures the entirety of, of an experience? And I, and I, I you cannot. As for, you know, and I, but I think that's part of my interest. I mean, because at first I made these performance pieces that were really designed for the camera, but I realized the making of it was was almost as dynamic as the piece itself. And I started realizing the performance element of these um, of the work. And, and that, you know, if I can somehow capture the experience in, a, in almost like a fractal kind of ex way that that this one five minutes can capture the feeling of what it was like to be there. I mean, it, it can't represent the experience, but somehow it, 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 it's like a fraction or if it is like looking at a part of a snowflake um, that is a representation of a part of, and another part and another part of the whole, then I'm successful. But I'd say I'm successful maybe 45% of the time. I mean, I, I think so a lot of the work is toilet paper work. And what I mean by that is like, I create it and, and I'm, I, I have to let it go. I mean, for whatever reason, why, I mean, it, because I'm working in a slippery, muddy terrain and it's really easy to make mistakes. And when I make mistakes, it, it, I mean, I think there's repercussions. Um, case in point, um, I think some of you may be familiar with the sign language um, interpreter for the Nelson Memorial um, uh, Service. He was the, the fake sign language interpreter. If you hadn't heard about him, you should look him up. For hours, there was a, a sign language interpreter for Nelson Mandela's uh, memorial service who didn't know how to sign. He wasn't a trained sign interpreter, but everybody was convinced that he was. And I was mesmerized by this. I mean, I'm as somebody who who studied um, sign language, I thought this was was almost brilliant that somebody could could fake it for nine hours, this close to to um, ninety heads of state you know, including Barack Obama, he was that close and he didn't know what he was doing. But when I started thinking about making a work about that, um, people in the deaf community said, no way, that's ridiculous. You're not the right one to make that piece. <laughs> and, and I had to think about it long and hard. I had to think about 
what was I doing? You know, it's like, I'm usually the one that is having conversations with other people. But in this situation, you know, a few of my black deaf friends had told me point blank that I shouldn't be doing that work. So it's, 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 again, it's, it's, it's making adjustments. You know, I think that I, I never finished that piece. It's, it's still in my studio and I'm, I, I'm not, I haven't finished it. But thinking about how, how to capture these moments and doing justice to them is, is hard. And I think that's why I'm getting back to, to your point is, Stephanie, I think that you were, you were mentioning that, like, how do you capture it? I, I try the best I can and, and sometimes I, I fall short. And that's just the reality and the truth. Well, I just want to say thank you for thank you for sharing that because you know that is um, the the way of art making, isn't it? Right? Like you know everything we make is not brilliant. <laughs> That's right. And but but there's this um, I think this power sometimes with with um, capturing a performance or or the format of video and film that that it can feel like every single piece has to be important and has to be the best, even though that's not the reality of being a maker. And so I think yeah. that's just a really powerful thing to think about. So thank you. No, you're right. And it's, it's, and we're, it's all approximation. If, if you're always happy and content with your artwork, I, you know, may all the power to you. <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, I hold myself under, um, you know, I think I'm pretty tough. And, and I think that, you know, every once in a while I'll hit the mark and it'll feel good. It really will. But I have to also realize that, 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 I, that sometimes I don't. And, you know, I think the, the more I do it, the, the better I think I, I'm becoming at it, but I, I have to, to realize that, that there's, there's, this is, you know, if you're not, if you don't understand failure's role in, in being an artist, then, then you need to become really familiar and intimate with, with the idea of failure and what that means and what it looks like. Um, because you, as Steffi was saying, not everything you make is going to be great. Jefferson, we have a question in the chat from a student. My question is about the space of art and activism when it comes to creating art in one regard or another, when it comes to the histories, both older and contemporary. Should members that don't belong to these communities interact with these histories in an attempt to educate or speak out, or is it encroaching on a space? Wow. Now yeah, that's loaded, isn't it? Um, <laughs> There's a lot in there. I would say, um, yeah, do it. Fall on your face. Make a fool of yourself. Have people call you a racist. Do it. Because I think it's like that you need to be sensitive, but I, you know, I think part of it is, is sensitivity and, and understanding. But I also think from an artist's point of view, if I'm telling you that, yeah, don't do that piece because, you know, you, you, you might make yourself into a fool. It's like, sorry, that's, that's not how this works. I think it's like, um, part, partly is, is, is finding that balance and, and relying on, on your friends, just like I did my, with my deaf friends. And I'm so glad I asked. Now, now, now the horror is I never finished the work. Um, I got so into my head that, it didn't, that the work never got, got complete. So what, what, I mean, you weigh it out. Is it better not to make the work or to make something and, and to be criticized? So I think the sweet spot's in between, but we can't always hit it. We can't. Um, I would say that, that there is some sensitivity. I mean, because I, I wouldn't want to be Dana Schutz. I, I wouldn't want, want that. I, I think that I would want to be the person who's informed. It's like, I made this work because I thought about it. it you know, I, I, I created, you know, this representation um, of, of a black spectacle, of black violence. Um, and I've consulted with these individuals and I would like to do the research, um, but, uh, it, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I consider I can sit and judge another artist for making a mistake. I mean, as long as they learn from the mistake, I think we should entitle ourselves for that and and for that failure. And I think that that is that slippage is is, is there's a sweet spot in there, you know. And it's not going to be doing everything safe and making sure I do the stuff of my culture. And um, it's it's funny that you ask this question. What is it, Alexandra? A Alexandria. It's it's funny you ask that question because at SAIC we I just had um a talk with fashion students and they have this, this class where they have to create um, garments from other cultures. And, and as you can imagine, that's, that could be a hot mess, you know? It's like, well, I, want, I created this sorry, you know, and I wanted to make it really like, um, you know, a little bit above the knees because that, that was my, my vision of a sorry. Then it's like, you're getting into this territory, which is really messy. But if, 
if you're doing the research and you're understanding it, I think there can be some really incredible, incredible things that, that can happen. I think some incredible inspiration, but at the same time, yeah, to say in this time, you, you know, that you have the free agency without being attacked to do that kind of stuff. No, I'm not going to say it. you may be attacked by all of your classmates, but are you, are you ready to endure it? Are you ready to say that I'm flawed and I'm mistaken and, and I'm not perfect? And, and I won't make that mistake again, because I think that's for the most part is all you really need to be ready to do is not make the same mistake twice. But, you know, don't, don't worry about like, you know, if this is yours and that, because I think that there's people who aren't going to necessarily um, follow those guidelines, but I think you should worry about like um, being sensitive. You know, I, I think that, that these things aren't, aren't exclusive. You can do both. We have one one um, attendant with their hand up. I think that might mean they have a question. C. Uh, yes, hello. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just uh, you're a yes. little quiet. A little quiet. Um, how about now? Yeah, that's better. That better? Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Jefferson. Um, really appreciate this insight and this generous like access um, to your process. Um, I had kind of a two part question. I wanted to ask you um, how you go about like doing the research for these pieces, like the background, it seems like there's a lot of research that goes into it. Um, and also how do you decide on the actions or the gestures that you end up using inside of the work? Um, for example, like the rowing in Ben-Hur or the training um, in the you know, Red Summer pieces. No, that's great. Really thoughtful question. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Talib Kweli, but one of his songs, he talks about finding inspiration from like watching trash, you know, float in a train station. I, you know, I, I know that's cheesy as hell, but I, I mean, I think you can find inspiration anywhere. And, and in particular, like um, if you're a student of history like myself, I mean, I feel like you if you have a curious mind, you're like, well, why is this? Why, why is it that way? Um, you know, a, again, it's like maybe starting with the fear of the water. Why, why are black folks afraid of the water? What happened in that lake? Um, and, and, and really kind of taking it from there. It's like, oh, wait, there was a, there was a race riot in Chicago. I want to know more about it. And then you, you, once you dive into that hole, you learn that there was a lot of race riots or race um, uprisings rather in uh, uh, 1919. So I, I think that part of it is, is being curious and being open for the history. Um, you know, it's, I, I think that's where, where it starts uh, for me personally is, is also trying to, to, to think about how you can use that history to empower uh, that, that perhaps a, a reenactment of the history can be more powerful than, than how we understand that history. And then also who is writing these histories that somehow maybe are we're rewriting the history by having that group of people on the lake in that given period of time. So yeah, I, I think that's, um, that's, it's part of the, you know, and, and then of course, I mean, technically, how do I get into the research? Um, sometimes I, I start doing the, the digging on my own, my own, starting with the internet, um, going to, to, to local libraries, because obviously you can't find everything on the internet as much as I wanted to find out information about the, the Camp Logan uprising that happened in Houston in 1917, I, I couldn't find anything online about it. So, you know, I had to dig in the, the libraries and until I found, you know, basically two books that I was able to use to base the work on. So it's, it's you know, just like any researcher, just trying to find out where's the information that I need, the court records um, and having help. You know, I have uh, usually one or two grad students who, who help me kind of dig through uh, you know, the, the material. And it's always great to have assistance, you know, or, or, or people who can help you and organize. And, and my, um, my grad students are, are really incredibly sharp and they'll, they'll, they'll catch things that I miss. And I think that's great. I think that's why um, I like this, this kind of practice in which I'm, I'm working with other people because I, I think that it, it allows for, new, for different ideas. Um, I think as much as th there is a particular amount of ownership of what I make, I also feel like there's so many people involved. I, I can't say it's ever really mine. I think it, it's, it, I produce the work because I feel like the work needs to be produced. Um, I think that's, that's the driving force. Uh, 
if it's my idea and if I'm driving, <laughs> if I'm <laughs> driving the idea, then it's mine. It's, it's my fight. But at the same time, if it means that three or four other people could get involved and it becomes a collaborative piece, the work gets made. And, and, I, and I am really excited about um, processes of working with other people. So yeah, I used to do, I used to have more of a solo practice, obviously. Um, but I, I, I'm not the kind of artist that can lock myself into a studio and, and, and hammer it out. And I know some of you are, but I'm here to say that, that there's a whole bunch of different practices that, that you could be successful at. It doesn't have to be just this one. So if you're not a studio artist and you do your work on your laptop, that's completely legitimate. You know, um, I'm not sure if I answered your com question completely, but I, I figure I should stop. Thank you. You said so down at the bottom, thank you for this response. Oh, thanks. Thank you. And um, uh, I think it was somebody asked when I started doing this work and I, I, my first performance piece was at like 1999. So since then, that was my first sh show. I was a part of a, a cooperative in Seattle of a whole bunch of different artists that, that we learned from each other. And we, we started showing our work together and, and that's, that's how I got started. And then I um, said, oh, I guess I should get a, a degree, <laughs> but I, I made the work and um, I was really excited to work with other artists. And I, if, if you have collectives and artist groups, I think the best way to learn as a, a young artist is, is to put yourself in a room with a lot of other critical young people who think similar to you and, and, and you know, just kind of go at it with each other you know, have good conversations about what you're doing. And you don't, you don't need much for that. Um, another question from Olivia. So helpful to hear about your working with and moving forward from falling short in projects as an artist. I'm curious about your decision to embroider names into the bulletproof vests of performers. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's a really uh, good observation. I know it's, it's so obvious, but I felt like it was really important that that you that within this collective that you still knew who everybody was. I didn't want everybody to get so lost that it was just like a, a reduction to the point where it was just either your number. And I think that's a big thing in any military training is you're just reduced to nothing. And I didn't want that to happen. And also it was a nod to um, um, Goat Island, uh, who we were originally inspired by. They, um, a Chicago Performance Theater company and they had their names on all of their their uniforms and I thought that was great and I think it fit well into this performance piece so the idea of like you know I want everyone to work together as a unit but I don't want us to forget who we are individually as well uh, maybe just one or two more questions does that sound okay um from Mark, do you have a particular audience in mind when you create a work? Do you aim to help your audience move through past the trauma of the American, African American experience? In our contemporary American drama class this semester, we started with Raisin in the Sun set in Chicago, and it seems like we still have not learned to live side by side as you examined in that Chicago neighborhood. Yes, what's the question? Um... Um, do you have a particular audience in mind when you create a work? Do you aim to help your audience move through or past the trauma of the African American experience? No, I, I haven't got to, to helping people move past the trauma. I, I wish, you know, that's just, uh, I don't know if that's my responsibility. Um, perhaps it is. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying I haven't thought about it or, you know, I, I think that I, I sit with it and I think we're all dealing with it. I think in the performance pieces, sometimes like in the, this is not a drill, I felt like we needed to be able to get beyond, you know, like a, a sequence of, of drill moves um, that were all about, let's see. Um, I was gonna show you a clip. I don't think I can navigate that quickly. Um, I love that you asked that question, but I'm not sure if, if I can tell you that, you know, I, I sit down and, and, and I can say we honestly, move through it as much as we're we're trying to, to deal with you know almost recognizing it i mean it's a new idea uh, it's i know it's crazy but like you know words with you know that like trauma and an association with the black experience is something that i've only heard over the last four years you know um i think there was was ways of expressing it but now the language is getting a lot more in depth and so i i think that the performance piece is about like recognizing pointing at it and and in some way, like um, 
physicalizing it and choreographing a particular kind of empathy. Um, but healing is, is boy, that's, that's deep. And I'm not sure I, I, I'm up for suggestions if you have any. Um, but I think this is kind of rough and tumble. And, and I, I don't think that I'm, I'm ready to heal from the trauma yet. I'm still busy dealing with it. Um, so yeah, what was the other question? I'm a little stuck on that one. Um, the next one is sort of related. Have you thought about or started doing any projects surrounding what's going on with Black Lives Matter movement in today's society, such as any of the recent deaths and result of police brutality? Yeah, you know, like I, I was saying head on is I'm trying not to, to be recognized as as um, square and, and, and one one particular activist or um, political mode, really. I mean, I think that I, I want as much agency as possible to, to be able to navigate between this, that, or, or the other. I want to be able to make a body of work that's not about this. I feel like almost like the more um, I squarely say that this is about this. Even the Mount Greenwood project is so specific. I mean, I'm just, I am painting myself into a, a really kind of um, an intense corner that I want to be able to move away from. Um, but I think that, that, that the times force the individual to, to grapple with these things. I mean, it's, 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 it's part of our collective consciousness. How can it not be a part of, of what it is that I make? But somehow I'm, I'm also like, I'm, I'm avoiding any kind of direct association and allowing it to, to, to exist in the periphery. I think if I was an activist, I'd be driving around that neighborhood much longer than I was um, f to get the good shots I needed for my performance work. Um, so no, I, I, I've thought, I thought somewhat about it um, as far as aligning myself with, with, with that political movement, but, but no, I, th I think the freedom in, is in, in, as in allowing myself to be an artist first and, and to think about like these things as, as like everybody else, as, as um, elements that are affecting how we're making, but we're not making, you know, well, at, at least I'm not. I'm, I'm not making specifically for, so I'm, I'm thinking more about like the association. That's a great distinction. The power and the slippage, I think you said earlier, <laughs> like that. Um, we just have one more question. Can you go more into depth on how Diego Rivera was involved in activism? He was the only artist mentioned that wasn't African American. Yeah. Yes, Diego Rivera, and then you know, I think if it was a different lecture, maybe I'd bring I'd bring up a whole bunch of um, artists that I was inspired by that um, that aren't African American. But I think there's so many African Americans that people just don't know about. To be honest, I mean, do you know about Hale Woodruff? Do you know about Charles White? And, and you know, so so these are the people that are. I think more directly related to my lineage of, of who I am as, as an artist, but boy, there's, you know, I could talk about Richard Diebenkorn, uh, you know, and how I, you know, you know, for a year and a half struggled to paint just like him until my teacher gave me the, you know, it's like, you know, stop, stop trying to paint. <laughs> You're not good at it. And I was like, that was like the freedom. I was Pat Craig, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it, it, you know, he gave me the, the freedom to, to make other things to, to think, you know, that I thought that maybe there was one route, to be an artist. But anyway, um, to answer your question, Diego Rivera, I mean, he was huge. Um, I think there are a few people in a, you know, African American art history that are more influential, but are talked about very little as, as Diego Rivera. I mean, he trained um, some of the most pivotal um, African American artists in that period of time. They went to Mexico City because they knew that Diego Rivera would work with him with them they you know and and it wasn't just um oh it was, you know elizabeth catlett um as i mentioned earlier decided not to come back to the united states and she lived in corn uh Vaca. she just said forget this i'm not going back to the united states and i'm, I'm gonna stay down here i'm an american artist but i'm living in mexico so i think there's just an you know i think there are reasons why this isn't taught i don't think it's 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 coincidence that you don't know the connection between diego rivera and uh, the Harlem Renaissance. I mean, it, it because that's powerful as hell. That that connection really establishes um, a, a, a connection from you know BIPOC people that that you know that existed well before the tyrant the term. That you know oppressed people um, knew that they had narratives to communicate and they helped each other to learn. I mean, this is is probably one of the the biggest things that's not in art history books is is that black artists learned from Diego Rivera, and and that he was um, a mentor. Um, 
to, to, to that movement. And if you take a look at, like, you look at the work of Hell Woodruff, you look at the work of Charles White, you can see it. You can see the connection. It'll take you a minute to take a look at um, Elizabeth Catlett's work and say, well, she, she was looking at, you know, Mexican muralists. Hell, she, she lived in Mexico City. So I, I think it's, it's some of the beautiful connections that exist um, and the intersectionality that, that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about in, in contemporary uh, or actually um, modern art history. So yeah, I'm, hope, I'm glad I turned you on to that. Take a look, research it. Um, are there any more questions for Jefferson? A couple thank yous there in the chat. Well, I'm going to add to that. Thank you so much, Jefferson. It's been wonderful to hear about your practice and to see so much of the of the evolution from many years ago to now. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. No, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Hartwick. Um, yeah, I hope you guys are hanging in there during this um, crazy time. And I hope you're all gonna go out and vote. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I, maybe I am an activist, I don't know. <laughs> 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 I can be now, um, but no, thank you. Thanks a lot, I appreciate it. Thank you, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.